All right, welcome back, everybody. Uh, we hope you had a, well, you, show us, show us, please. How was yesterday's program for you? A little bit of clapping? Good. I, I, how many of you went to the uh, social event last night as well? Yay. Amazing Good. talent last night. Fantastic, good job, good job. Welcome back for day two. Welcome back for day two. Uh, a little bit like yesterday, there's going to be a lot of things coming your way, a lot to choose from. Check your program very carefully. To start the day off, we're going to go back one more time into the world of, shall we say, art and performance to give us a kickstart and a little bit of inspiration to our day. We have some special guests. Mr. Steve Bingham is a gifted graduate of the Royal Academy of Music and founder of the Bingham String Quartet, one of the most influential quartets in the UK today. He gives solo recitals on violin and electric violin, acts, consults, teaches, records, plays with numerous other musicians, and in his free time, apparently, he even pursues a passion for bird watching. Today, he performs with Jeremy Harmer, a popular figure many of us know through his influential ELT books and publications, blog, his teaching, his training, his numerous conference presentations around the world, and especially because of his concurrent keynote session that he's going to have with us today. Together, these two gentlemen produce a very special audio recording, Touchable Dreams. In it, they explore the lovely, powerful interplay of music and voice, the spoken word playing alongside musical expression. As Steve and Jeremy have said, we want to show how music and words, the very basis of human emotions, can coexist and enhance each other's power for one of the greatest emotions, love, of the human existence. We're very proud to be able to welcome these two exceptional, talented individuals to our stage this morning for a truly unforgettable performance. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome Mr. Jeremy Harmer and Steve Bingham. Good morning, everyone. I hope you're feeling all right. Um, many of you will be familiar with the three Toy Story movies. Have you seen Toy Story? About this interplay between kids and their toys and love and so on and so forth. But this is not a new theme. Because actually, in a book called The Velveteen Rabbit, published in 1922, Marjorie Williams wrote a story of incredibly similar kind in which she discusses the magic world of childhood and toys. And we're going to start with a little piece from The Velveteen Rabbit, which we've called Being Real. <coughs> What is real, asked the rabbit one day when they were lying side by side near the nursery fender before Nana came to tidy the room. Does it mean having things that buzz inside you and a stick out handle? Real isn't how you are made, said the skin horse. It's a thing that happens to you. When a child loves you for a long, long time, not just to play with, but really loves you, then you become real. Sometimes, said the skin horse, for he was always truthful. When you are real, you don't mind being hurt. Does it happen all at once, like, like being wound up, he asked, or, or bit by bit? It doesn't happen all at once, said the skin horse. You become. It takes a long time. That's why it doesn't happen too often to people who break easily, or have sharp edges, or who have been carefully kept. Thank you. 
generally, by the time you are real, most of your hair has been loved off, and your eyes drop out, and you get loose in the joints and very shabby. But these things don't matter at all, because once you are real, you can't be ugly, except to people who don't understand. The one thing you don't need to do at a conference for language teachers is persuade people of the power of story for language learning. Indeed, the power of story for all of us, because we tell stories all the time, whether it's a story of what just happened on the way to the university or whether it's a story of something powerful that happened or something we read in the newspaper. And that's why this conference will end with the most extraordinary storyteller, Jan Blake. But we thought it would be a good idea to start this morning uh, as well with stories. The combination of music and story and music and words, as you kindly said in your introduction, is something that the two of us have been working on uh, for a long time. Because we find that when we mix particularly poetry and music, something extraordinary happens to the words. And something extraordinary happens to the music as well so that the music sometimes seems to play with the meaning of the words, and the meaning of the words kind of colour the music. And of course, everybody knows this. Uh, you, you're familiar with the kind of uh, experiments you can do where you show people a scene from a movie, and you can change the meaning of the scene completely just by changing the music. Of course, people have always realised this. There are works of, uh, in the classical music uh, repertoire where people mix narration and music. And what we're going to do next is precisely one of these uh, kinds. I was in Peru about two years ago, and I went to listen to a teacher talking about storytelling. And she was trying to make a difference between stories that teachers tell extempore, improvised, and ones that they read. And she happened to read one of my favorite children's stories ever. It's called Ferdinand the Bull. Uh, Ferdinand the Bull is about bullfighting in Spain. Now, as I'm sure you're all familiar here with what bullfighting is like, let me just tell you that the art of bullfighting involves a bull being sent into the bullring and people cheering and ladies and gentlemen. And the first of all come the banderilleros, and it's their job to stick the bull and make it bleed, to make it angry. And when they've done their job, the picadores come along on their horses with big lances, and they go like this to make the horse, the, the bull angry and upset till when the matador comes along, the very smart matador comes along with his red cape, the bull is enraged but also weakened by this um, terrible uh, event. And finally the matador picks up his sword and he plunges it into the neck of the bull and if he gets it in the right place the bull falls to its death on the blooded sand. Uh, of course, in Spain, bullfighting is now controversial, and some parts of Spain are trying to ban bullfighting. This story, having given you that cheerful introduction, <laughs> is written by a British composer called Alan Ridout, and it's called Ferdinand the Bull. Thank you. 
Once upon a time, in Spain, there was a little bull, and his name was Ferdinand. All the other little bulls he lived with would run and jump and butt their heads together. But not Ferdinand. He liked to sit just quietly and smell the flowers. He had a favourite spot in the pasture under a cork tree. And he would sit in its shade all day. And smell the flowers. Sometimes his mother, who was a cow, would worry about him. Why don't you run and, and play with the other little bulls and, and, and skip and, and butt your head, she would say. But Ferdinand would shake his head. I like it better where I can just sit just quietly and smell the flowers. And because his mother was very understanding, even though she was a cow, She let him sit there and be happy. As the years went by, Ferdinand grew and grew until he was very big and very strong. All the other bulls who had grown up with him in the same pasture would fight each other all day. They would butt each other and stick each other with their horns because what they wanted most of all was to be picked to fight in the bullfights in Madrid. but not Ferdinand. He still liked to sit just quietly under the cork tree. And smell the flowers. One day, five men came in funny hats to pick the biggest, fastest, roughest bull to fight in the bullfights in Madrid.
all the other bulls ran around snorting and butting, leaping and jumping, so the men that would think that they were very, very, very strong and fierce and pick them. Ferdinand knew they wouldn't pick him, so he didn't care. He just went to his favourite cork tree to sit down. He didn't look where he was sitting. And instead of sitting on the nice grass in the shade, he sat on a bumblebee. Well, if you were a bumblebee and a bull sat on you, what would you do? Wow, did it hurt! Ferdinand jumped up with a snort. He ran around puffing and snorting, butting and pouring the ground as if he was mad. The five men saw him and they, and they shouted with joy. Here was the largest and fiercest bull of all, just the one for the bullfights in Madrid. What a day it was. Flags were flying. Bands were playing, and all the lovely ladies had flowers in their hair. They had a parade into the bullring. First came the banderilleros. Next came the picadores. Next came the matador, the proudest of them all. Then came the bull, and you know who that was, don't you? Ferdinand went to the middle of the bull ring, and everyone thought he was going to fight fiercely and butt and, and stick his horns around. But not Ferdinand. When he saw the flowers in all the lovely ladies' hair, he just sat down and smelled. He wouldn't fight, no matter what they did. He just sat and smelled. And the banderilleros were angry. And the picadores were angry. Uh, and the matador was so angry he couldn't show off. He cried. So they had to take Ferdinand home. And he is sitting there, 
still, under his favourite cork tree, smelling the flowers just quietly. He is very happy. Uh, last year, as, as some of you may know, was the 200th anniversary of the birth of Charles Dickens. And so the British Council in London asked Steve and myself if we would put together a show to celebrate this fact. And what we did was to find extracts from uh, some of Charles Dickens' books, which we were able to combine with music and sound effects and so on. And one of the pieces we did then, we're going to do now, uh, and it's the end of a novel called Great Expectations. I won't explain the whole plot to you because, in case you don't know it, because Charles Dickens' plots are so complicated. But in brief, a young boy called Pip lives with his uh, sister, his elder sister and her husband. And because he helps a criminal at the beginning of the book, he's given money from a, an anonymous source uh, to give him great expectations. And Pip, of course, makes a bit of a mess of it. He, the money goes to his head, if you like. And, and he doesn't behave in a terribly good way. Part of this might be because, as a boy, he was taken to a place called Satis Hall, in which lived this extraordinary old lady called Miss Havisham, who wore an old wedding dress and one shoe missing and was very peculiar. And the reason she was so peculiar is that years before, on her wedding day, her husband-to-be failed to arrive. And not only did he fail to arrive, but he took most of her money as well. The result was that Miss Havisham cursed all men, and she decided to take her revenge on mankind. And the way she did it was to get hold of a beautiful young girl called Estella. And she taught Estella how to be nasty and unkind to men. But of course, if Estella was going to learn how to treat men badly, she needed someone to practice on. And who did she get? Young Pip was taken to Satis Hall, where Estella was pretty horrible to him for a long time. Now, I don't want to be too self-revealing, but if there's a beautiful girl and she's horrible to you, what do you do? You fall in love with her. And that's what Pip did. And so, throughout the whole of Great Expectations, uh, Pip's Pip passion for Estella is unrequited. Indeed, she goes and marries a really bad guy, uh, and he's distraught. Later on in the book, at the very end of the book, uh, after Pip has gone to work in America, he comes back to England. In the meantime, Miss Havisham's house, Satis Hall, has burnt to the ground and she has died. So as a kind of nostalgic trip, Pip decides to go to Satis Hall, the ruins of Satis Hall, because there's nothing else left because of the fire, and he goes there to say goodbye to it for the last time. Now, everybody, all Charles Dickens' fans, and he had many fans, all his readers, because people read him week by week, like a telenovela, like a soap opera. All his fans desperately wanted Estella and Pip to get together again at the end, because that would make everyone, ah. But actually what he wrote was a scene in which they see each other in the street and they just go, <laughs> and walk away. His friend said, you can't do that, Charles. You've got to do something better. And so he wrote this ending instead. A cold silvery mist had veiled the afternoon and the moon was not yet up to scatter it. But the stars were shining beyond the mist and the moon was coming and the evening was not dark. I could trace out where every part of the old house had been and where the brewery had been and where the gates and where the casks. I had done so and was looking along the desolate garden walk 
when I beheld a solitary figure in it. The figure showed itself aware of me as I advanced. It had been moving towards me, but it stood still. As I drew nearer, I saw it to be the figure of a woman. As I drew nearer yet, it was about to turn away when it stopped and let me come up to it. Then it faltered as if much surprised and uttered my name. And I cried out, Estella! I am greatly changed. I wonder you know me. The freshness of her beauty was indeed gone, but its indescribable majesty and its indescribable charm remained. Those attractions in it I had seen before. What I had never seen before was the saddened, softened light of the once proud eyes. What I had never felt before was the friendly touch of the once insensible hand. We sat down on a bench that was near and I said, after so many years, it is strange that we should thus meet again, Estella, here where our first meeting was. Do you often come back? I have never been here since, nor I. Estella was the next to break the silence that ensued between us. I have very often hoped and intended to come back, but have been prevented by many circumstances. Poor, poor old place. The silvery mist was touched with the first rays of the moonlight, and the same rays touched the tears that dropped from her eyes. Not knowing that I saw them, and setting herself to get the better of them, she said quietly, were you wondering as you walked along how it came to be left in, in this condition? Yes, Estella. The ground belongs to me. It is the only possession I have not relinquished. Everything else has gone from me, little by little. But I have kept this. It was the subject of the only determined resistance I made in all the wretched years. Is it to be built on? At last it is. I came here to take leave of its change. And you, she said in a voice of touching interest to a wanderer, you live abroad still? I do, and do well, I am sure. I work pretty hard for a sufficient living, and therefore, yes, I do well. of you, said Estella. Have you? Of late, very often. There was a long, hard time when I kept far from me the remembrance of what I had thrown away, when I was quite ignorant of its worth. But I have given it a place in my heart. You have always held your place in my heart, I answered. And we were silent again until she spoke. I little thought, said Estella, that I should take leave of you in taking leave of this spot. I am very glad to do so. Glad to part again, Estella? To me, parting is a painful thing. To me, the remembrance of our last parting has been ever mournful and painful. But you said to me, said Estella very earnestly, God bless you, God forgive you. And if you could say that to me then, you will not hesitate to say that to me now. I have been bent and broken, but I hope into a better shape. Be as considerate and good to me as you were, and tell me we are friends. We are friends, 
said I, rising and bending over her as she rose from the bench. And we'll continue friends apart, said Estella. I took her hand in mine, and we went out of the ruined place. And as the morning mists had risen long ago when I first left the forge, so the evening mists were rising now. And in all the broad expanse of tranquil light they showed to me, I saw no shadow of another parting from her. By the way, if you like Steve's playing, and I'm guessing from that applause that you probably do, he's got a few of his CDs with him and he'd love to sell them. I just thought I'd tell you that. Um, <clears throat> um, so there we are. We just wanted to give you a tiny little flavor at the beginning of this morning of how music and, 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 and words can go together and perhaps enhance each other and make things sound good. And we will just end with a little poem of mine, if you don't mind, um, because this is a story as well. This tells the story of an entire love affair in 10 lines. Uh, and and um, it's mixed, uh, because the thing, by the way, which we find so extraordinary is that the lines of this poem have not been changed since they were written. The last three lines are a translation from an Argentinian poet, but that's neither here nor there. Uh, and, and the piece of music, which is? Isai. Isai. Sonata number two. Sonata number two has not been changed either. He's playing the notes exactly as they were written, even before I had written my poem. And, and we just found that they kind of mix together. This is a poem called Knocking and Pulling. I knock on the door. She pulls me in. I stay not long enough. She dreams of love. I knock on the door. She lets me in. I stay far too long. She turns me out. I knock on the door again. She allows me in reluctantly. I walk in far too far. She turns me out. I knock on the door again, and again, she denies me entry. I stumble in, push past her. She turns me out again. She turns me out.
all this, all this knocking and, and, and pulling and, and turning out. Hey, carpenter, make me a coffin, a small coffin of perfumed wood. Our dream just died. Thank you very much. See you later. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you. That was really an incredible performance. Jeremy and Steve, thank you very much for that inspirational start with our day. Uh, we, we, had, we, had, we had big romance yesterday morning, right? We had big romance. Is that the microphone? There we are. Are we okay? I was just saying, we, we had this, this big collective romantic sigh to start our day yesterday, and today all the men in the audience are thinking, yep, been there. Mean woman, fall in love. That's how it goes. If you watch the, the Twitter feed, by the way, you'll see a lot of the wonderful comments uh, progressing through the, the feed. Continue, please. It's entertaining to, both to watch the feedback and your insight into these things.